It really is a privilege and an honor to be here with you this morning. I see some uniforms that look so familiar because I think 45 plus years ago, I wore some of those uniforms. I won't tell you which one. The others I'm still looking for that I'm hoping were going to be familiar, but I haven't seen them yet. So it's my honor and privilege today to talk about promoting inclusion for diversity in science. Let me start by just telling you a story because I think I started my walk into science at a very young age. I am the fourth born in a family of five. That is, my mother's children are five. My father was polygamous, so I do have some sisters who are much younger. I didn't grow up with them because uh, uh, they grew up in a different space. But of my five siblings, I'm the fourth born out of five. Now, when we were born in those days, in the very the late 50s for some of my siblings, the early 60s for me, people didn't know too much about family planning and contraception. So I describe us as a staircase. You know, every year, much to my parents' surprise, another child showed up. And then because of, before they could figure out what had happened, another one showed up. So there was a whole load of us, uh, five of us, between me and my younger, my younger sibling, who's a brother. They lost one child, and so there was a little bit of a gap between us. Now, my eldest brother was someone who was very curious. And he had a lot of experimentation in him. I remember this one particular day when he told us, he told us that he had learned something from school. In the compound where we lived, where we were growing up, there was a big tree and it had a hole inside it. And there was a bee, a number of bees that had built a nest and a hive in there. Now my brother told us that he had learned that the way to get honey was you take a big stick, you stick it inside, Doctor, the dean is already laughing because I think he can figure out what's going to happen next. You stick it inside the hive, you shake it round, and then when you take out the stick, guess what you're going to have? Honey. Now, we were very foolish, so of course we followed our big brother. So we went to the big tree, hollow tree, he took his stick, he stuck it inside, he shook it and shook it, and of course the bees were making noise. And he said, yeah, that means there's a lot of honey. And he shook it some more, and they made an even louder no noise, and were all there eagerly waiting, you know, for this honey. Then suddenly we saw this swarm of bees come up. Of course they were angry with us. And what do you do when you see a swarm of uh, angry bees come towards you? You run. Clearly, if you had been there, you'd have done the same thing. We ran. Now, the mistake that happened is, of course, in the process of running, my brother forgot to throw down the stick. The sad thing is, somehow, he had captured the queen bee in the stick that he had. So he was running, and the bees were coming after us because we had their queen bee, and we on our short, stubby legs were all running behind him. And so we ran around the compound a number of different times. Eventually, he told us, at the very first opportunity, he ran into the house. And somehow we got into the house, and we slammed the door, and the bees circled around. My mother might have come home to find she had five used-to-be children who are no longer alive. Because African bees are also known to have a very bad sting. And for some time, sometimes it can be fatal. But that was one of my early forays into science. I have learned since. I have learned not to follow blindly. I have also learned not to always believe what I am told. But I am fortunate in the sense that I had an opportunity to get an education, to go to school. I've had many opportunities to advance my knowledge. And that has led me into really entering the space of science. The woman in this picture and I have many things in common. But sadly for her, she didn't get as many opportunities as I did. I met her many years ago when I was working along the shores of Lake Victoria. At that point in time, she was only 17. She had had one child and was pregnant expecting a second. The reason I got to meet her was because she had tested HIV positive and she had come to clinic and we were providing expanding HIV care services in the area that she lived in. She didn't know the serostatus of the partner that she had. He had refused to be tested. 
it was her mother-in-law who made decisions and he had said that she should not that he should not be tested so she couldn't convince her partner to get tested she was on treatment she could barely survive she had dropped out of school because she had been orphaned and therefore she had no funding to be able to go to school what are we going to talk about today i hope in the next few minutes that i have that we'll be able to cover what does it mean to have diversity in science i hope i'll be able to share with you some strides that have been made to incorporate diversity and i hope that we'll be able to talk about what happens even when there are people who have disabilities who work in science i hope i'll be able to convince you to think about the opportunities and the benefits of diversity to think about the threats that there are around diversity but then think about some of the initiatives that are ongoing now that promote inclusivity and allow for diversity to happen and i hope in conclusion you will join me in being able to work in this area knowing that the sky is not the limit for you if you set your mind to it and you have the opportunities there are many things that you can achieve so let's start by defining when we talk about diversity what are we talking about we're talking about our differences i love the fact that there are different uniforms in this space today it's part of the diversity that there are differences that we can have but then what do we mean when we talk about inclusion we are saying that each and every one of you is valuable and we want to respect and empower you and allow you to be able to contribute your talents to making a difference in the space that you're in now but also in whichever spaces you will be in the future now in science there's been a lot of talk about diversity and there are many advances that we have made in just being able to incorporate diversity i'm glad the dean was talking about the numbers that they had when he was engineering school when i was in medical school many years ago we were about a class of 110 and i did my medical school at the university of nairobi but we only had about 15 ladies among in the class the majority of them were definitely men so when we talk about really diversity we are talking about including the representation of those who are underrepresented and let's not just think about just male and female think about other people as well other individuals either who may have disabilities or from the different parts of Kenya the different countries counties the different backgrounds we come from ensuring that there's good representation from everywhere so we are really talking about acknowledging and celebrating the fact that we can be different but being different should not be a, a matter of giving us divisive outlooks it should be a matter that allows us to include and recognize our differences are actually strengths because these do contribute to the fact that we can have breakthrough within the scientific world i want to take you back and think about the education sector that we all belong to in one way or another but that the majority of you here belong to because you're right now in school and our actual statistics are showing that we're not doing very well now when you think about it think about primary school and i want to just show you uh, by using my cursor to be able to show you that when you think about enrollment in primary school Initially we have almost equal when we start off boys and girls about 95% 96% that's okay and I've taken CIA as one of the counties that I'll use as an example so when you think about countrywide or you think about a place like CIA lower in in a place like CIA because in the urban areas we tend to have more enrollment high numbers however look at this by the time you get to secondary school we are talking about 67% for boys 57% for girls the girls are already dropping out and when you go to the rural areas it's even worse 27% in CIA 23% comparing this to where we came from the sad thing is that when you think about girls aged between 9 to 13 and these are the girls who are transitioning from primary school into secondary school most of the girls in this country actually live in a rural setup and we have 80% of them who actually start primary school but by the time we get to secondary school we have less than 20% just about 14% in the urban areas which only has about 14.5% of the total girls in that age group we start off with about 68% and about 30% who end up in the education sector in the secondary school meaning we are leaking we are leaking people who could be in this scientific field at a very early stage let me emphasize it a little bit more for you okay 
Let's look at the education sector. When you start off with the primary school, the early childhood education, this is nursery school, okay? So we have about more women enrolled than men. Now, that is not a surprise because when you think about the general statistics, we actually have more women than men. Why is that so? The natural selection order, women tend to survive earlier. And even if you look at children, female children survive better than male children. For some reason, nature just has it that they're more diverse, they're more robust. So we have higher numbers. But look at this. When you come to primary school, already the girls are dropping off, 46% versus 51%. When you come to secondary school, we're already losing the girls. By the time we come to university, the boys are definitely in the majority. And when you, we don't have enough information in our postgraduate. So when we're talking about completion rates, look at this. Our completion rates are actually quite dismal. Only 68% of the men, lower secondary, and 37% of the women. So we are losing out people, and they are bleeding out at some level. When we think about those who are working in science, there definitely is a preponderance of men. 52,000 in the science sector compared to 21,000 when you're thinking about the sub-Saharan region. And just showing this a little bit more, we have many more men in the science field than we have women. And why is this? One reason is because sometimes women are made to feel like, no, they can't quite do the science. Science, math, engineering, all those are difficult subjects that are more for the men rather than for the women. And that is actually not true because there is nothing genetically that would make it more difficult for a woman to do science than for a man. It's purely in the attitude, it's purely in the cultural norms, it's purely in the say, the things that people talk about that then discourage women from getting into science. When we're thinking about this country, remember that we only have about 28% of women who actually work in STEM. A number that really should make us hang our heads in a little bit of shame. Thinking about the engineers that the Dean was talking about earlier, only 8.4% of those who are registered are actually women. So women in science are still, unfortunately, we are still lagging behind. And these numbers are really attributed to inequality and discrimination. Unfortunately, even today, when families have a challenge with the amount of money that is available for education, guess who gets sacrificed? The female child. And again, it's because our working industry is slated in a manner that means that women and young women go into the workforce much earlier. There's a demand for house help for lowly paid individuals, and most of these individuals end up being young women rather than being young men. The Dean talked earlier about the numbers, but he also talked about the women being here and there, just a few. This is actually illustrated by the lack of women in leadership in science. And in many institutions, you will find that women are in the lower tiers of the workforce, but when you go higher up, when you start going to departmental heads, to deanships, to vice chancellors, then you have very few women who are in leadership positions. So women are underrepresented when it comes to the leadership of universities, and then there's a lack of professional confidence that also contributes to this. They say that when any job is advertised, a woman who is fully qualified, meeting every single, every single criteria required, will still hesitate and wonder whether she ought to. A man who has even two of the qualifications will apply. You'll bear me witness, a few years ago, we had advertised for a chief justice. Do you remember a young man who was in law school and had not even finished, who applied for the job? He applied. He had not even finished doing law. He was still a student, had dropped out because he didn't have enough money to finish. He had the audacity to actually apply for the job of the chief justice. How many women who fully qualified for the position were still hesitating, wondering whether they should even apply? So what strides have been made to actually be able to incorporate more women in the research field? Raising awareness like we're doing now is one of the key ways in being able to change this. Just ensuring that people are aware. And all of you young ladies who are in high school who are seated here, this should be your opportunity to be able to think about it. If you like science, if science makes sense to you, 
or even if you like the arts, social sciences are just as important. This is an opportunity for you to think about what can you do? How can you use, utilize those skills and those talents you have to be able to get to the highest possible opportunity that you can? There have been funding initiatives that have been made that allow for more women and more inclusivity of those who are, have special needs. And really focusing on trying to create equity and inclusion within the science field. One of the key things that has made a difference, and I know that has made a difference for me, is mentorship. I have had mentors throughout my life, and especially in my science field. The word that um, our newly minted upcoming doctor was struggling with, obstetrics. It's obstetrics. It's, it's always a problem for people. Obstetrics and gynecology refers to the care of women. That well, was my first subspeciality in medicine. The care of women during delivery, and gynecology refers to all the other diseases and challenges of women. So I have had mentors when I did my obstetrics and gynecology, and even more when I did my Masters of Public Health at the University of Washington and my PhD, I had mentors who invested time and effort in ensuring I learned, I grew, I had the opportunity to build my scientific portfolio. Now I do not see women on a regular basis every more, not at patients. I work in the research field. I actually focus on reproductive health needs of women by doing research that will be able, I hope, to make a difference in the lives of the women that I hope to serve in this country and beyond. So mentorship is key. Finding mentors who are able to provide support. But the second thing is also role models. When you see other women who have succeeded, then you know there's no reason why you yourself cannot succeed. Ensuring that we're actually addressing this gender bias to be able to ensure that we can meet the needs of women. What are some of the challenges that women face even when they get into the research field? We have that unique and important role of childbearing. But then women lose years in their careers because of the childbearing years. And unfortunately, the scientific world and a lot of business does not recognize this role. And so while women are busy caregiving, a very important role because if women don't reproduce, we will become extinct. If there are no new babies born, if there are no new individuals coming into the world, we will not exist. But while they do that very important function, they lose out on those years. It's very hard to be running a scientific career, doing research, working in whatever field while you're also bearing children. And three months of maternity leave that many people give, some don't even give that three months, is not enough. Children need their mothers for those first two years. It's a very critical time in a child's life for a mother to be available and to be able to give the care for that child to develop well. So it does cut into the time that they need for uh, growing their careers. Kenya has tried as a country to be able to do some work in this area. And one of the things that has been important is really adopting the issue of gender mainstreaming in all the different frameworks of science. And this has been acknowledged in the Science, Technology, and Innovation Act of 2013. There's also been designated funds by the National Commission for Science, Technology, and Innovation, NACOSTI, and the National Research Fund, the NRF. They have funds that are dedicated to women scientists. They put out a specific call saying this is a call for women, sci women scientists, both for doing research and even travel grants that provide this. They also talk about trying to do skills building. And there's been a focus, and some Kemri centers, particularly the Center for Global Health that is based in Kisumu at Kemri, has been trying very hard to focus skills development for women in specific. However, these are not enough. Even though it has been done, it is actually inadequate. But one of the key things is also just gathering data chalking up the numbers to be able to say how many women do we have in any particular sphere because that is very helpful. I will provide these slides to the organizers so I hope you'll be able to get them. And one of the books that would be very nice for you to look at is just be able to see what are some of the stories about women in sub-Saharan Africa that have made a difference in science and what are the stories that tell about their lives. Are there benefits? Are we just keeping on talking about including people, including people, including people, but does it actually make a difference to include people? Yes, it does. The reality is the diversity that we bring to the table as women and as different people with different abilities actually makes for an enhanced social benefit. The science is better. We think differently 
as different individuals and as different genders and different sexes. And that diversity brings about a strength that cannot be done by one gender alone. There's more effective or translation because as I keep hearing, I work really a lot in the HIV field. And one of the things I keep hearing because my focus has been around young women. For me, the face of HIV in the world has been a young African woman. And what I keep hearing from the field is young women saying, don't do anything for us without us. And it is an important thing because we cannot do things for people without them. If we do not include them, we do not know what their needs are. We do not know what they want. And we do not know what works for them. And the solutions that we come up with, we may come up with fantastic new pills that supposedly stop HIV. But if people can't take those pills, they have nowhere to keep them. They have no privacy in which they can swallow the pills. They have no space in their lives in which they can accommodate our innovations. Then it doesn't work for them. But one of the important benefits is just the improved workforce that we end up having when you have this diversity. I want to shift a little bit from women and talk about those who have disabilities. Because this is another area that is important when you talk about inclusion. Why is it important to talk about, about disability? There are certain disabilities that are not a disadvantage and that can allow people to still be able to practice within the field of science. And right now, because there's so many innovations that help individuals to be able to work, even despite disability, we should not exclude them. When I was in university many years ago, before many of you were born, many of you sitting here today, one of my friends was a young man who was doing law. And in those days, there weren't enough materials for those students who were doing law who were blind, and he was blind. And what we used to do is we used to rotate a number of us, and we'd go and we'd read for him the law textbooks. They were fat law textbooks. I still remember a book that was called The Book of Taught, because I kept thinking, what on earth is taught? And who is taught? And why is this book so fat? And we would read for him, and as we read for him, he would type in Braille, so that he would have notes that he could then later read on his own. And different ones of us who were his friends would go and read for him every evening because he didn't have access to the materials. Now, he was one of the top graduates in his particular class because he had the support from a group of friends who would read to him. One of his gifts was actually music. He was a very talented guitar player, really, really great guitar player, and also had a very beautiful voice. But there weren't enough resources. Right now, with the computer technology and the AI we have, there are a lot more resources that can help people with disability be able to work even within the science field and be able to achieve their highest potentials. But unfortunately, many people have a negative attitude. The fact that someone has a disability, people already feel that that means they're not capable of doing what others would do. And then our schools and our universities are not friendly. I notice we have a ramp here, so indeed, Dean, congratulations. You are making sure that even if someone did have a disability, that they could get up here. I'm not sure how they would get onto the stage, but at least they could come right down to the bottom of the podium. Making sure that we are providing inclusive areas for people to be able to learn and creating funds that allow those with some disability, because it's not a choice of their own making, but they do have things that they can contribute, and we do need them to be able to contribute to us as well. It gives us enriched perspectives, and it actually does ensure that we can generalize the findings that we have. It allows us to think about the ethics of what we do and how we do it. And with this better representation, it makes sure that we are socially responsible to ensuring everybody within our community has the support that we need. We'll never have a perfect community. And nobody is going to be the same and nobody is going to be perfect. So regardless of what disability someone comes to the table with, they're a person of worth. They're a person who's created in the image of God and needs to be respected and accepted in the same way. So what are some of the challenges that we face in being able to promote science? Financial constraints. Just putting in enough money is one of the biggest challenges. And because we live in a world that is financially constrained, this remains a concern. While policies may be there, people don't enforce them. And so this creates a gap for us. 
because the education sector, which is a very important sector, unfortunately, is constantly grappling with lack of funds. Our public universities are really struggling right now. Maybe Strathmore, because it's a private university, is a little bit better off, but they're really struggling. Keeping up infrastructure to be able to cope with the numbers has really been a challenge in those spaces. We need materials adequate materials to be able to learn. And our numbers, and even in the high schools, I've seen some pictures, so I don't believe everything that the press says, but I've seen some of the pictures, and I don't know if those of you who are in high school now would be able to say, within your high school spaces, is there enough resources? Are you sleeping in comfortable dorms? One of my nieces, who was in one of the public schools, whenever I would talk to her, she kept telling me about how she has to put her trunk at the end of her bed. And I was like, if you're putting your trunk at the end of the bed, how are you sleeping in that bed? She says, I just have to sleep. But then I'm saying, then you're squashed up. How are you going to get a good night's sleep when you can't even stretch out? Because there's no space, there's nowhere else for you to put that trunk. Sometimes we have very negative attitudes. And all of us have this challenge. And it's an important lens for us to be able to look at and say, how do I react when someone is different from me? When someone doesn't do the things that I think are normal to do, how do I react to them? And what is my attitude? Mentorship, I've said, is key. Networking, and I hope you'll make good networks here. And I hope you'll also think about who are the people you want to look up to and where can you get mentorship from to be able to help you grow. We have not done well as African scientists. Our visibility is low. If I was to show you a map, there's a certain map that's available on the internet about publications from the world. If you look at the map of Africa in regards to publications, it's like a thin, hungry, lean, almost dying continent, whereas the others are bludgeoning and huge and fat. We have a lot of resources. We are not making use of them enough. We love our oral culture, which is very good. But we need to do more in terms of writing, documenting, and publishing. And someone might say, but why? Because there is power in a lot that is documented because it stays for posterity. My words are here in the air and they will go. But the things that are documented and written can last beyond my lifetime and be seen by others who will not even meet me. And because there have been these inequalities, both within our countries, within various regions in sub-Saharan Africa, and globally, these really create for challenges in us being able to promote for inclusion in the science field. Gender biases, there have been a lot of restrictions around women. When I was in medical school, we had a surgeon who used to say he doesn't want any female surgeons. And in fact, they had even made a statement that so long as they were the, they were the head of the surgical unit, they were not going to accept any women. When I started my training, my residency training in OBGYN, one of my consultants came and said to me, I don't like you women who come into obstetrics and gynecology because you never give us enough hours. You're always saying, my baby is this, my baby is that. Now, this is a, um, a doctor who's taking care of women, helping women deliver babies. And he's busy saying, I don't like these women who are also saying, I mean, you don't tell your children to get sick. If a child is sick, a child is sick. And because he may have a wife who goes to take care of his child, he's busy lecturing, you know, I don't like women who, you don't give us enough hours. But the biases that we also create, also create the system. Again, when I was doing my residency training in OBGYN, one of my biggest hurdles was the nurses that I worked with. And they were much kinder to my male colleagues than they were to me. I had to prove myself. I had to prove that I was capable and that I was even more capable than the men. They would not cooperate as easily with me. They would give the men an easy time, and they would not give us an easy time. You see it even in the labor wards, that sometimes the female nurses are not as kind to the, to the women. I can see some people who've gone through it saying true. They're like, what is so difficult about this? Just go ahead. Yes, everybody feels pain, and everybody's going to give birth, and you move on. And you're like, you know, my pain right now is my pain. It doesn't matter what you felt and what you felt. This is my space and my pain. So we are sometimes are our worst enemies, and the biases that restrict women to certain work make it very difficult because of these gender biases. But let's always think about the opportunities. The diversity and inclusion really bring an enhanced workplace innovation. It helps us address the issues of structural biases that have existed for a long time. In many countries, by the way, including a lot of the developing world, for the same job, same job, same qualifications, men would earn more than women. 
And even now, there are some insurances where a man will get an insurance that covers him, his wife, and his children. When the woman goes to get the insurance, they're told only your children. They will not cover the spouse, which doesn't make sense. If you're employing a man in that space and you're going to give him a cover for his wife and his children, why will you employ a woman and not give a cover for her husband and for her children? So these biases unfortunately still remain now. Our insurances still remain very unfriendly. They limit the gynecological cover. They limit the cover that can be given for women who are giving birth. You will only get up to a certain amount. Beyond that, you have to pay on your own. Why? For something that is so important, so normal, so natural, and so key in keeping the world moving in terms of delivery. So we still have a lot of inequalities. It will enable us to support female scholars and allow them to be able to really capacity build for women who want to work in science. It allows us to be able to access resources that we probably wouldn't otherwise access and leverage the youthful or the young population that's growing up so that they can make use of these. I really want to push for mentoring because that is such a key part in being able to make a, di a difference in diversity. And we really need to push for issues of not just policy change, but embracing the policy and able, being able to implement it. I'm a good timekeeper, so I want to go beyond the time that I was uh, allocated. So I want you to really think about this is not just a problem, it is an opportunity. We want to enhance the innovation that can be brought to the table through making sure that we have public engagement like this one to be able to promote a broader view of how we can get more women in science. It will increase the competitiveness of our institutions and also of our industries. There are threats, and I've pointed to some of these before, the biases that we come to the table with. Your own biases as a woman that you think you can't do it. The biases that the young men around you may be saying, thinking that they are better than you. There is nothing that actually says they are better than you, genetically or any other way. You are just as good as everyone else. The fact that we don't have adequate representation should not keep us there. Sticking into the stereotypes that make it feel like women should always just stay in the background. That is something we should not embrace. And then just making sure that we continue to push back so that there are adequate opportunities for us to access the resources that we need to have. There are many programs, and I hope you can access some of these, initiatives that allow us to be able to think about opportunities where women can be promoted and be allowed to be able to have opportunities in science. Now, as I close, I want to tell you another story. I was attending a meeting that was actually linked to the United Nations in New York. And we were making a call really for <clears throat> putting more money into work that was going to help promote what we call the dual, attending to the dual needs of women. Many women need a contraceptive so that they can control fertility when they need to. But you know, many women also need protection against sexually transmitted infections. For many sexually transmitted infections, they manifest in men more easily than women. So a man who has a sexually transmitted infection will very quickly complain about discharge, pain on passing urine. For many women, they do not have those symptoms. So they end up staying with infections that could stay for a long time, cause a lot of damage to their reproductive system, even render them infertile. So we were in a meeting in the United Nations, we were talking about in New York, we were raising these concerns about raising awareness and putting more money into reproductive health research. Now that was like at the end of the week. I traveled over the weekend and I came back into the country and then traveled up country to go and visit my grandmother. And in my grandmother's small kitchen, she still loved her small kitchen. She still loved, even though you know we had made available other facilities for her, she still believed that her three stones, her three stones and her, her firewood was the best way to cook certain things. So having come from a very high flung meeting in New York where we were talking, three days later, I was in this smoky kitchen with my grandmother having a conversation where she was even lecturing me that I was not cooking the ugali the way she wanted me to cook it. And I thought, what a privilege for me as an African woman to be able to be in such diverse settings that I can be at a top level UN meeting talking about issues that are affecting women globally. But then just a mere 72 hours or less later, I can be in a kitchen with my grandmother 
who's very busy and she doesn't even care that I was at a UN meeting or what. Her concern is, am I cooking this ugali properly? And is this the way I taught you how to cook it? And there's too much smoke. You need to know how to ensure that there's not a lot of smoke when you're cooking. So we need to embrace the diversity of our lives as well. That being in one place does not stop you from being in another. Each one of us has the responsibility for what we do. It's not just about the big things that people do elsewhere. It's about the small things that you do. And I want you to take a moment in your space, whether you're a student, whether you're a lecturer, whether you're male, whether you're female, whether you like science, whether you don't. What can you do? It's not about big things. It's about the small things. What difference can you make? As I close, just remember, we can embrace diversity. We can create mentorship and support. We can be inclusive, accepting that people being different from us doesn't mean that we don't accept them. And each one of us can be a voice speaking for change, asking for all of us to be able to do different. An inclusive world starts with each one of us choosing to respect the perspectives of other people just because you think differently from me doesn't mean that I can't accept you. Standing up for others who need support. Being a voice for others who don't have a voice. Because this is what it means for us to be able to be a diverse population who can embrace inclusivity and be able to make a difference even in the world of science. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a really good morning of discussions.